All right, everybody, glad to be with you going through the Bible in a year, Thursday, June 20th. One last uh, video of studying through the Bible in a year from our getaway beach location here. It ends today for us. Um, so we'll have some nice scenery, though, in the video for one more day. So for today, Thursday, June 20th, we have... James chapter 1, that's one of our readings. And then we have 1 Kings chapter 13 to chapter 14. All right, we're going to be in James chapter 1. All right, so if you could turn there, if you are able, um, we will get going. We'll open up in prayer. So, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth, Lord. Thank you for this book of James. Thank you for him as an apostle, for his leadership, Lord. Thank you for what you put on his heart to write to other um, churches, to other Jewish believers, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're working in our lives, Lord, and you're growing maturity in us, Father, so we could be um, better used by you. Help us to embrace that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the book of James. Um, only five chapters. It's a short one. And uh, this guy, James, who wrote it. Oh, we have a guest Good morning. There she is. Um, James, who wrote it. There's a bunch of Jameses in the Bible. This particular James is the brother of Jesus. <clears throat> and if you could imagine growing up with Jesus as your brother, some real, that'd be an interesting life. Highs, lows, everything in between. Um, that must have been challenging, uh, to say the least. But it's interesting that his brother James comes to receive Jesus um, as his Messiah and Lord and Savior, um, even though it was his brother. <laughs> interesting journey. Because people ask, you know, like how, how many family members of Jesus uh, like received him as like Messiah and Lord and Savior. And it's tough to answer that question. We know, you know, some family members, but a lot we don't. But for James... Um, we know that he did. He actually became a pillar, a huge leader in the early church. Um, in Acts 15, there was a big decision that had to be made, and James stood up, and out of um, the 12 apostles, he kind of became the leader for a while. During actually a really difficult transition time, as the church was transitioning after a death of Stephen and um, the church starting to spread. It's hard to have good leadership during transition, but James was the guy, and... Um, Church tradition holds that uh, he died by getting thrown off. <coughs> and it's a tradition. Don't know for sure, but church tradition holds that he was thrown off of the temple wall and then beaten with clubs. And then as they were beating him with clubs, he was praying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. So an interesting man, a leader of a man, um, seemed like kind of a no-nonsense guy. I think that's a good example, too. That or that path, that verse he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I've used that a couple times in my life where I'm just angry at someone. Obviously, I'm not being beaten by and thrown off a wall, but when people wrong you and you just feel like they don't know what's going on and they don't know the full story, it's just you got to just surrender it to God and give it to Him. Yep. I think that verse sometimes goes through my head in those moments and how someone who is being beaten and killed could say those and our little you know things in life are much more small and trivial compared to that yeah much easier said than done plus yeah. like you said most of our lives at least here in america it's not like we're a christian in iraq right like we just get offended right people right. were mean or hostile or, right intentionally wrong towards right. us and to say father forgive them yeah. uh, it's almost a very foreign prayer right. so it's definitely shows us where our hearts need to be mm -hmm. where our spirit wants to bring our hearts if we'll let him because he'll bring us there just gotta let him if we're stuck in our pride it won't happen mm. so James sorry went off track off track we'll do a know. lot that a lot of that when i'm on here because i have thoughts and then we go off on tangents <laughs> tangents are legal tangents are legal 
five chapters in the book of James. The whole book's really about spiritual maturity. Someone had said, not me, although I'd like to claim it, but it's not me. Just because someone grows old, it does not mean that they grow up. Truth. Very true. Just because somebody grows old does not mean that they grow up. Um, you could have very immature people um, that are older. And conversely, you could have some young people that have some amazing maturity. Mm -hmm. uh, maturity. Wise beyond their years, right? Wise Isn't beyond that their the years. Statement? I didn't make that one up either. It is. That's oh, not, but maybe I should I say I did. That's not. That's not. It's uh, not from the Bible. It's not origined from you? <laughs> no. Oh. It's not from the Bible, but it fit with what we were talking about. Yeah. So if maturity doesn't come from age, it must come from somewhere else. Experience, for sure. Mm -hmm. And really what we do with those experiences. And if we say we're a Christ follower, God allows certain experiences into our life with the purpose of growing us, mm -hmm. maturing us. Yeah, they're usually not, I don't think like easy experiences you could say trials trials that's, a, that's another james keyword trials. it is but you know it's not usually the easy experiences that grow the wisdom because you don't really need a ton of wisdom in an easy experience what do you mean oh man now you're gonna ask me an example that's okay. You can get back to me on that. Yeah. I, I mean, you grow your wisdom in the hard times where you, you're you desperate and you reach out to God and you don't know what to do. Ah. That's what I'm saying. Gotcha. Not in the, in the like, yes. easy. I mean, obviously, you learn things along the way. You can learn wisdom along the way. Yes. But in the, in the desperation is where the wisdom is developed. Yep. In Which the weeds, it, the wisdom is developed. In the weeds. In the weeds, there can be wisdom. Ooh, wisdom in the weeds. Possibly. All That's right. good. If we embrace it. We didn't plan that one either. <laughs> so to be a, a Christ father, God uses circumstances, um, <clears throat> trials. Sometimes deliverance will not come sometimes um, a quick fix or even a fix in general won't happen. Mm. Sometimes God will just allow trials and circumstances to play out and he's looking for us to ask for, Lord, give me the wisdom for how to handle this so I can grow the way you want me to grow instead of me just getting through it. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a tough one. Thrive, not survive. Yep. And with this idea of, Lord, give me the wisdom for how not to waste this situation. Mm. Help me not to waste this trial. Most of us are praying, Lord, just have this be over. Yeah, Fix this thing. It. Get yeah. this out of here. Yep. Spiritual maturity will pray also, Lord, give me the wisdom so I don't waste this. Yeah, so what, do you have, can... what do you have for me Right. in the midst of this? Right. Like, what are you trying to grow? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to teach? I wish I prayed that prayer more often during tough times. Mm. That's convicting. Mm. Yeah. You probably mastered it, but... Mm, you know, I am. I am pretty good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Although I must say my last uh. trial that I had, even though it was tough going through, I definitely had this, like, underlying current... No pun intended, we're at the beach. I had this current that I knew God was trying to teach me something. Like, I, need, I know this is hard. I know I'm still going through it, and I don't want to still be going through it, but I know I haven't gotten fully what he wants me to get yet. So there was some type of um, comfort in knowing that he wants me to learn something the way he wants me to learn it. Yes which is not my way. That's weird. Mm, I know. Gotcha, get clean into sucks. that. Kinda sucks. sucks. But yeah, I know that, that that was definitely a shift for me because it hasn't always been like that my whole life. It hasn't always been 
I'm usually just get it over with. Let's be let's be done with this. But this was the last couple ones were pretty much had that un underlying current in them where I know there's something else going on. It's not just the hard things in the moment. There's something else to be learned. Yeah. That's good. That's a work of the spirit in mm -hmm. your life and in your heart. Mm -hmm. Haven't always been able to say that. No. So we celebrate that, right? We celebrate. So let's read a little bit here, and then we're going to show you a little illustration. And that'll probably be it, because we're 10 minutes in. So we're not going to get real far. We're probably just going to get down to verse, uh, uh, verse 8. So James, the bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's kind of interesting that James says he's a bondservant of God and his brother. To the twelve tribes are scattered abroad. So he's writing to specifically Jewish, the twelve tribes. Um, Jewish believers scattered abroad. Verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Um, so I guess trial... NIV says pure joy. Yep. When I read that, that kind of stuck out. It's like, oh, pure joy. Like... You're all in. Like, it, it, there's no, nothing else. Yeah. I didn't like that. Because <laughs> trials are not pure joy. That's not the first thing I think of that no, comes to my mind. Me neither. And I would say, too, it says when you fall into various trials. I think James, when he's writing here. Because you can have trials because you make really stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. And you're being foolish. Right. Or sometimes rebellious. Right. Or sometimes... Um, just like rejecting something God said very clearly. Yeah, like Jonah. Yeah, and that's more like a... He like totally yeah. rejected God. Yeah. For all you elementary class, we just talked about that. Under the sea. <laughs> yeah, uh, he, he made his own trial because he chose yes. not to listen to what God was telling him to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like... Um, that's like way too common. Mm -hmm. People say they experience hardship, trials, and persecutions, but very often times we are making the problems for ourselves. Worse. Yeah, and or even making them all together. And uh, people try to paint that in the light of God's giving them lots of trials. But they're just making bad decisions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's like, mm, got to be yeah. careful with the way we throw language around. Because mm -hmm. one of them is like, oh, God is bringing this my way. And the other one, if you're being honest about it, is now I brought this upon myself and now I'm going to have to own it and deal with it. Right. So I think even having the awareness of which type of trial it is is really important. Yeah. Because if, really, if you realize that it was you, there's a lot to learn there. Yeah. A lot. Like, how did I get here? Why did I get here? Yep. Where did I not listen to God along the way? Yep. What did I miss? Yep. Those types of things. Totally agree. And I think um, that James is talking about the kinds of trials that come with being sold out and following through on the gospel. So from the enemy. Yeah. That's what I think. Like living a life where Jesus is at the center, advancing his kingdom, mm -hmm. his way of living, his wisdom, his truth. Just by doing that in this world, you get trials and attacks and persecution and difficulty and hardship. And I think he's writing to those people mm -hmm. to encourage them to say, hey, listen, don't, don't, you know, be complainers and grumblers and wish for it to be over. This is kind of just comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. So consider it pure joy that like you're experiencing what you should be experiencing. Mm -hmm. There's a real warfare and battle out here and that's what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Um I think that's what he's getting after. Mm -hmm. And then he goes a little further. He says in verse three, verse three, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or uh, perseverance. perseverance. Um, the testing of your faith. So James is saying, hey, listen, as far as God is concerned, if he brought you to this and, and this kind of landed in your lap when he says you fall into trials, mm -hmm. just kind of landed in your lap. 
the Lord's not going to waste it, like you had alluded to before. Right. He's going to use it um, to grow your faith um, and your patience and your endurance. Yeah. And you can't grow patience and endurance by listening to a sermon. Right. You have to put it into action. Yeah. You can't. You have to do stuff. You have to change stuff. Yeah. You can't just do the same old thing. You can't. And endurance makes it sound like it's like last. You know, I think of a runner. You know, you need endurance to finish like that right. two miles or three miles. Or you just watch the Olympic swimming trials. Yeah. Like you need the endurance to do it. You, you can read a book on it. You could yeah. listen to a speaker about it. Well, they train you their could, whole lives too to do that. If you, think, if you put it in terms of swimming. It's not just like, oh, they show up one day and you just ace the, the race. Right. It's your whole life with these people it's your whole life and nothing produces the endurance or perseverance like actually going through it and doing it right like they could lock themselves up in a classroom and learn from the best swimmers of all time hall of famers and have them explain to them what to do when to do it right but that doesn't build any endurance or perseverance right. it does build a lot of knowledge right right but no endurance and perseverance and james is saying that's similar to the Christ follower, we got to go through stuff. If we're gonna be have some endurance and perseverance and be battle tested. Mm -hmm. Got to go through stuff. I I think too that even those trials that we bring on ourselves, that maybe our stupid mistakes, our disobedience, like Jonah, God can use too for His glory. Absolutely. And He can, um, you know, maybe bring you some, through some of those trials to really see to bring you to a place where you can then have the awareness for what the I don't want to say the real trials because they're all real trials, but I think God's gracious and that he uses those too to build that kind of, um, you know, perseverance and knowledge and wisdom. Yep. 100%. Because then you can look back and you say, wow, I really caused that myself. That was really stupid. Right. But you have that wisdom now from realizing the stupidness that you were walking in. <laughs> right. To bring you forth. Right. And have more awareness. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, God can redeem either kind of trial. The one we shot ourselves in the foot or the one that just landed in our lap because we're doing the right thing. Right. <clears throat> um, verse 4, he says, But let patience have its perfect work. If you don't learn patience, you don't learn much of anything. Mm -hmm. Just getting gratified in the moment now, getting what we want all the time when we want it. We don't learn anything. Mm -hmm. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect. And in most of your Bibles, there's probably a little footnote. And the word is mature, that you may be mature, complete and lacking nothing. So then there's that theme again, right, of spiritual maturity. Mm -hmm. James is hitting on that right in the beginning of the book. And he's making a point to say, hey, listen, these trials coming your way, guys. These 12 tribes of brethren, trials coming your way. Let it build endurance, let it build patience, because maturity needs to be there so that you're not lacking. Mm -hmm. And then he gets into what you had talked about earlier, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Which is interesting because we had just, on Tuesday we did uh, 1 Kings chapters 9 and 10 and really started in 1 Kings 3, but Solomon asked for wisdom. Mm -hmm. And what's crazy about Solomon is... He asked for this wisdom, and the Bible says he's the wisest man who've ever lived, but he lacked the heart or the humility to live out that wisdom, and he kind of became one of the foolish mm. men, 700 wives, 300 concubines, and it says they led his heart astray after false gods, mm. and he knew God's law that said, hey, listen, a king of my people can't live, and then there's all these things that a king should not do and he just maybe he was too impressed with himself maybe he thought he was above that but well, it just goes to show you that anybody can have the downfall or anybody who even the wisest you know yes the wisest person in the world can fall to that stuff yep yeah and i think real wisdom needs to have humility mm -hmm. attached to it um and so it says here, if you lack wisdom, um, Jesus alluded to that too in the book of Matthew, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, mm -hmm. who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And that was a good move that Solomon did make. 
when God showed up to him the first time, he said, hey, what do you want? I'll give you anything that you want. Mm. And he said, I need wisdom. Because he was humble then. He's like, I don't know how to right. rule these people. I don't know what to do. He yeah. just got into the position. He recognized it. Yeah, he realized his uh, insufficiency and his inadequacy. Yeah. And he's just like, I, I don't want riches or money or anything. I, I want to figure out how to be a ruler. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. And that was a good ask. And the Lord blessed him with that. And then prosperity, money, riches also soon followed. Mm -hmm. Which got him, part of that got him into trouble. But it was a good ask for wisdom. And it's interesting how the rest of life, uh, his life, really went well once he started to have more and more wisdom. Um, and so, why is he talking about wisdom in the, in, the, in the middle of trials here? And I think it's like what we talked about before. Lord, give me wisdom for how to handle this trial. Give me mm -hmm. the wisdom for how to respond, how to think about it. Um, give me the wisdom of what to do here. Uh, we can ask wisdom for other things, but James is talking about as people are going through difficult trials and situations. Right, specifically. Yeah. So this is where we're going to do an illustration. Verse 6, it says, But let him ask in faith. So when you're asking, James is at least talking about wisdom here. Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Mm. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So, let's see here. Should we go into the water or should we just move out of the way? Uh, I don't know. We'll go into the water. All right, we only got a few minutes left in here. Oh, you can't turn around. Oh, so we'll go like this. <laughs> well, they can kind of see like that, right? So if they look right now. Here, let's go. What are you doing? I don't know. There we go. All right. So, right, if you look, we'll bring, bring you a little closer. Right? There's the water, right? Very calm. No waves. No wind. All right? Very calm. And James had said uh, that a man who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed around by the wind. And what's interesting is that it's so calm and peaceful out there right now. But if the winds change... Well, the first day we were here, it was pretty windy. It was pretty windy that and first day. And there was day. a lot of white caps. Yep. Yep. And what's interesting is that those uh, those waves, well, there's really none right now, um, but there isn't really any right now because... <clears throat> because there's no wind uh sometimes i used to read it early on and think that well what if some james is talking about something being in the sea like if you had a paper cup or a can or something on there and it's getting thrown around but he didn't say anything about an object being thrown around the sea he talks about for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind so waves how they behave, how big they get, is determined by the wind. They are completely dependent on the wind. Affected a little bit by what's underneath the waves, the, the, the ground floor of the ocean, the ocean floor. But the wind, for the most part, the wave is determined by the wind. And James is saying um, that someone who doubts is like a wave of the sea. Mm -hmm. Which, to me... Uh, that sounds like when it says is like a wave of the sea um, he's saying when we doubt we are kind of in the same way like a wave we just respond based on the wind blowing right. based on the circumstance happening and they're perpetually going waves are perpetually never, going never. you're always stuck yep like oh. when you're when you're doubting you're oh, like, oh, like a wave you just keep going it's there and it's driven by outside forces driven by outside Ooh. forces that's the key one who doubts is always driven by outside forces yeah one who doubts is like one who's always driven by outside forces so that must mean that someone who lives by 
faith and is praying for faith, asking for wisdom and faith, um, they are not solely, specifically driven by outside forces. Does that make sense? Yeah, sorry, I was distracted by the truck that just uh, drove up to the house. Yeah. So to me, it's, it's pretty amazing imagery that, you know, the waves, they're basically dependent on the wind. But um, what we ask for from the Lord and how we communicate with Him, it doesn't have to be dependent on our circumstances and what happens around us. That's what faith is about. And right. James says, when, you know, you just ask, you ask and you have all kinds of doubt in your heart and in your mind of who God is and what He's doing, is He even in control, what's He doing? Um, and you pray with doubt and you speak with doubt, uh, you're like a wave that's just getting tossed around by the wind. It's just the latest thing in life is just affecting what you say and what yeah. you believe. And James saying, that's ridiculous. Yeah. You should know what the truth is. Like you should be speaking it. You should right. be praying it. You should be believing it. Even when you can't see it. Right. That's what faith is. Well, I think it was kind of a good illustration we talked about yesterday is we went out on a kayak and I don't like the feeling of being out of control and we went out to like way over there and we got into some rough water and it was, not that it was rough listen i had my phone on me and i just broke my phone and got ran over by a car so i was a little worried because i wanted to get pictures. you didn't get run over by a car your phone my phone yeah my yeah. phone got run over by a car and we already used the insurance policy so i can't use it again so <laughs> Anyway, we're in the kayak and it got rough because we got to where the ocean meets the river. And we were talking about how we, or you, were able to paddle us out of that harm's way. So it's like, I sometimes feel like when you're in the waves, we try to do it our own way. Like I didn't trust and I didn't, believe that I was going to be okay. So I started freaking out and then Jared had to paddle us out of the bad Let's go, Jared. <laughs> bad waves. So somehow that relates. Pull it together. Pull my outward thoughts together into what we're talking about. <laughs> it's my life's mission, isn't it? Uh, I think what you're saying is uh we were caught in some difficult ways and you freaked out and I had to uh, say well I don't care and I will get us out of it and uh, we have a boat it's not gonna tip we have oars we can just keep paddling and we'll be fine but if we f but what's interesting is that because you started to get fearful you just got froze up yeah and that actually makes it worse yeah and that is our tendency when fear settles in we just like freeze up and yeah. we get paralyzed and kind of get like overcome by the moment. And you, you get overcome by the doubt. <clears throat> I feel like that then takes over. Like you doubt what you have. You doubt what you're with. You doubt. Right. And then that, the doubt and the unbelief that the we were just, just talking about is, yeah, He's is the enemy just that. like using that He's to cause fear, panic, anxiety, yep. all that stuff. Yep. No doubt. No doubt. And it just allows you to even be more swept up with everything because of all of that. Right, right. And you're totally, now you're at the mercy of the wind because you've just lost it. Yep, 100%. Absolutely. That's just a small example. Yep. And also, too, I don't think James is saying, like, hey, because, like, the water out here right now is, like, really calm, you know, that's, like, uh, an ocean filled with faith. And then when there's, like, big waves or a storm behind us, then, like, the ocean is filled with doubt. That's not what he's saying. Yeah. saying that the waves they just respond to the wind and what's happening yeah there's just a simple response and he's saying when you live by faith there's not just a simple response right. um to the chaos around us um, so a really natural question then is um you know how does somebody how can we just sort of not doubt that's way easier said than done yeah and well i think you learn that through maturity and trials exactly See? So it all comes back around. It does. James knows like what he's circle. talking about. And it's right in the passage. You know, we didn't make anything up. It's right there. James said it. Um, faith 
needs to be tested, needs mm -hmm. to grow. And as our faith grows, and it does also say in scripture that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you got to hear the word, you got to be around the word, but then you mm -hmm. also have to live life and go through things. Mm -hmm. And then doubt um, gets smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And it's like a spectrum. It's not like a light switch. It's more like a spectrum where it changes. Even in the New Testament, you know, the man, Jesus asked the man, he said, hey, do you want your son made well? And he said, well, I do, but help my unbelief. <laughs> he wasn't rock solid, um, zero doubt, but Jesus still worked with it. Yeah. And, uh, and that's encouraging to know. And then he can give you the hindsight as to what, when you threw it, what happened and what can you learn from that? Yeah. And then how do you, how do you make your doubt less next time? How do you trust God more? How do you believe in what he's saying more? Yep. Believe his word. And what he says and the promises he has in there absolutely god you know you're I, you said you're going to give me wisdom give me wisdom i'm asking you and what does that look like right verse 7 it says we're going to finish up right here for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the lord james says hey listen you're going to be filled with doubt it's continuously speaking it uh believing it and uh just embracing doubt and fear um, he says in verse 7, Let not that man suppose he's going to receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so um, that double-minded man phrase, it's only used twice in Scripture, both in the book of James. And the idea, when you look at it in Greek, the word is, and I'll just show you real quick, it's just really interesting. Um, the word in Greek is uh, di, di psychos. That's not exactly how you say it in Greek, but um, D I P S Y C H O S. Psychos, psychology, die, meaning doubled. It's like the double minded man has like two psychologies, two mindsets happening mm. and going on. And James is like, the Lord can't work with that. Yeah. Um, he can't work with, with embracing a lifestyle that cultivates a double mindedness. Mm. Um, the truth is, like, we're, we're, we're working through those things. Um, but to embrace a lifestyle that just continuously one foot in, one foot out, kind of believe this about God, but then I still want to do my thing. Yeah, I kind of mm -hmm. like that truth about God, but I don't like that one. Yeah. And this whole double-minded thing, um, James says, uh, unstable in all their ways. Mm -hmm. And that word in Greek is really interesting. Two psychos. Psychology. Mm -hmm. um, psychotic in nature um, mm -hmm. to have this double-minded thing going on. Well, you think so. about it too. I know we're getting late, but... Yep. Like you, we have the spiritual end of things, the God's <clears throat> spirit in us, but then we also have the enemy sometimes trying to work in our minds too. So there's, there's sure. this, this like constant, like the spirit battling the enemy that's we're gonna unfortunately have to live with while we're on this earth. Yep. To for our, you know because it's fallen and there's sin everywhere. Yep. Absolutely. I think it's, it's like a constant struggle for everybody. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. So we need uh, his spirit to help lead the way. Mm -hmm. So let's pray. We're definitely later, a little bit later than usual, three minutes over. Oops. And 30 minutes is usually long, so. If you made it through to the end, nice. But there's two of us, so there's more <laughs> to say. <laughs> True. And I bring us off on tangents, so. Tangents Sorry. are good. Tangents are good. A different perspective. Yep. So Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for James' encouragement. And the truth is, <clears throat> we don't want to waste trials and difficulties. And Lord, forgive us for the times, Lord, that we've shot ourselves in the foot. We've made bad choices. We've created trials needlessly. Mm. We're sorry for that, Lord. And Lord, for, for the trials that have come into our life because we're walking rightly before you, um, we know you're not going to waste it. We're filled with hope about it, Lord. And uh, God, we want to be able to pray more often. Um, give us wisdom on how to handle the trial. Show us how to behave, how to think, how to act in it, Lord. Give us wisdom. Help us not to waste it, Lord. Mm. And uh, Father, protect us from being double-minded. Mm. Our fleshly nature, that's, that's natural and common. It's what we want to do by default. But by your Spirit, we know that uh, that's not what you have for us. So rightly, a mind, uh, rightly align our minds so we can live more from the mind of Christ and less from this double-minded, confused, chaotic nature, Lord. 
Mm. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. So God bless you guys. Have a good day. Have a good day. We will... Uh, See you on Sunday. Yep. And God willing, we'll do another one on Tuesday. Right? Me and you? I don't know. We should. I don't know if the kids would allow that. I mean, I do bring a good... It's definitely a better video. There's no doubt. There's no <laughs> doubt. There's not even like a... No doubt. We got all these kids. It's a problem. No, it is not. <laughs> it's a blessing. It is a blessing. But it's a problem when you try to sit down and do something. No doubt. In the practical sense of the word. Yes. Yes. All right. Time for us to go. God bless you guys.